I want to uh, welcome back. Uh, Thank you. I'm John Jeff from uh, California, where it's nice and sunny, I hope. Mm -hmm. and, uh, here where spring is just beginning. Um, we uh, are very privileged to have you join us once again and to be able to talk uh, in depth about some of the deeper teachings of the Buddha. Uh, for those of you who are just joining us for the first time, uh, Tanisaro Bhikkhu has visited us a number of times before to talk about chapters uh, related to On the Path, one of his uh, important books about the Eightfold Path. Uh, he is a member of the forest monk tradition and abbot of uh, Metaforest Monastery, which is between San Diego and Los Angeles. Um, without too much uh, further introduction, since most of us already are familiar, we want to welcome you and uh, looking forward to your teachings here tonight. So thank you very much for coming again. Yeah, well, thank you for having me. Let's start with some meditation. If you already have a method you like, go ahead and meditate that way. I'm going to try the breath meditation method. I'm going to be introducing right now. Okay, we can follow that too. Start with thoughts of goodwill. Goodwill is a wish for true happiness. It's part of our motivation for being here. We're looking for a happiness that doesn't harm anyone. So we want to have goodwill for everybody. Because if our happiness harms someone else, it's not going to last. And we're not going to feel comfortable about it. So this is one of the reasons why we practice is we want a goodwill to be universal. So start with thoughts of goodwill for yourself. Tell yourself, may I be happy? May I be truly happy? May I understand the causes for true happiness and be willing and able to act on it? And then spread that same thought to others. Start with people who are close to your heart, family, your very close friends. May they find true happiness too. Then spread that thought out in ever widening circles to people you know well and like. people you like, even though you don't know them so well. To people you're more neutral about. And to people you don't like. Remind yourself that the world would be a much better place if everyone could have true happiness within. And you don't want your goodwill to be limited by your likes and dislikes. Spread thoughts of goodwill to people you don't even know. not just people, living beings of all kinds, east, west, north, south, above and below, out to infinity. May we all find true happiness in our hearts. Now bring your attention to the breath. Take a couple of good, long, deep in and out breaths. Notice where you feel the breathing process in the body. It's that flow of energy in the body that the Buddha is talking about when he talks about breath. Focus your attention where it's clearest, and then ask yourself if long breathing is comfortable. If it is, keep it up. If not, you can change. Try shorter breathing, faster breathing, slower breathing, more shallow, heavier, lighter. Okay, 
experiment who obviously work with them and texture breathing feels best for the body right now. When you find a rhythm that feels good, stick with it until it doesn't feel so good anymore. And you can change again. Try to be on top of the needs of the body in the present moment. If your mind wanders off, you don't have to follow the thoughts. Just drop them and you'll be back at the breath. If they wander off again, drop them again. Each time you come back to the breath, reward yourself with a breath that feels especially good deep down inside. That way the mind will be more and more inclined to want to come back to the breath. As for any pains in the body, you don't have to pay any attention to them right now. Focus on the areas of the body that you can make comfortable by the way you breathe. Now, as the breath gets comfortable, there is a tendency to drop the breath and focus on the comfort, in which case you lose the focus of your concentration. So to counteract that tendency, the Buddha recommends that the next step is to be aware of the whole body as you breathe in, the whole body as you breathe out. And a good way to build up to that whole body awareness is to go through the body first, section by section, to familiarize yourself with how the breathing feels in each part of the body. So start down around the navel. Locate that part of the body in your awareness. Watch it for a while as you breathe in, breathe out, see what rhythm of breathing feels good there. If you feel any tension or tightness in that part of the body, allow it to relax. So that no new tension builds up as you breathe in. And you don't hold on to any attention as you breathe out. Now move your attention up to the solar plexus and follow the same three steps there. In other words, one, locate that part of the body in your awareness. It's right in front of the stomach. Two, watch it for a while as you breathe in, breathe out to see what rhythm of breathing feels good there. And then three, if there's any sense of tension or tightness in that part of the body, allow it to relax.
you know, move your attention up to the middle of the chest and follow the same steps there. You move your attention up to the base of the throat and then follow the same steps there. So bring attention to the middle of the head. As you breathe in, think of the breath energy coming in, not only through the nose, but also the eyes and the ears. In from the back of the head, down from the top of the head, going deep into the brain. Then as you breathe out, think of it radiating out from the head in all directions, working through any patterns of tension you may have in the jaws, in the forehead, the back of the neck. And gently dissolving those patterns of tension away.
So focus your attention at the back of the neck. As you breathe in, think of the breath energy coming from the back into that spot. And then going down to the neck, the shoulders, the arms, the wrists, the hands, out to the tips of the fingers. And then as you breathe out, think of it radiating out from all those parts of the body into the air. And as you get more sensitive to these parts of the body, if you notice that you're holding more tension in one side than the other, allow that side to relax to bring things into balance. And then see if you can keep it relaxed all the way through the in-breath, all the way through the out. Keeping your attention focused to the back of the neck. This time, as you breathe in, think of the breath of generating there, and then going down both sides of the spine and down to the tailbone. So as you breathe out, think of it radiating out from the entire back into the air. And here again, if you notice that you're holding more tension at one side of the back than the other, allow that side to relax to bring things into balance. Then see if you can keep it relaxed all the way through the in breath, all the way through the out. Now move your attention down to the tailbone. And as you breathe in, think of the breath energy entering there and then going down to the hips, the legs, the feet, up to the tips of the toes. And as you breathe out, think of it radiating out from all those parts of the body into the air.
And here again, if it, you see if there's more tension in one leg than the other or, or one foot than the other. Allow that side to relax. And keep it relaxed as you breathe in and as you breathe out. Now it completes one cycle in the survey of the body. If you're meditating on your own, you could go through the body as many times as you like. For the time being, try to choose one spot that feels most congenial. Allow your attention to center there. And then from that spot to spread out and fill the whole body. So you are the whole body breathing in, the whole body breathing out. <clears throat> Be especially diligent in keeping your range of awareness filling the whole body because it will have a tendency to shrink, especially on the out breath. So each time you breathe in, whole body. Each time you breathe out, whole body. Allow the breath to find whatever rhythm feels best. If you find yourself blurring out, go back to the survey of the body. But otherwise, try to maintain a sense of centered but broad awareness. It's healing for the body, healing for the mind. Because it's still and yet all around. It's a good foundation for insight to arise. But for the time being, don't worry about the insights. Just try to make sure that this foundation is strong.
Okay, I invite you to continue meditating while I give the talk. We we'll have time for questions and answers afterwards. We've been reading Majjhima 137, the Salaya from the Ripanga Sutta. And it covers a lot of topics. But in particular, it has a lot to say about equanimity. So tonight, I'd like to focus my comments on equanimity. What the sutta has to say, placed in the context of what other suttas have to say about the topic. So you can get an all around view of it. The Buddha saw that feelings and emotions can be developed. You're not just stuck willy nilly with whatever arises pleasure, pain, equanimity, whatever. This means that issues of karma and the Four Noble Truths get involved. You have to think of the results of developing a particular feeling. This is especially true with equanimity because, as the Buddha said, sometimes it is to be developed and sometimes it's not to be developed. The kind that's not to be developed is equanimity that leads to laziness or defeatism. <clears throat> a common example you see in Buddhist circles is the idea that all things are in constant and impermanent. It's the only way to find a measure of happiness to stop trying to find something that doesn't change, except the fact of impermanence, and try to content yourself with that. Actually, though, there is nirvana which doesn't change. And so if you content yourself with just accepting impermanence, you're going to be missing out on a big chance to find something real value. The kind of equanimity that is to be developed is equanimity that allows you to accept setbacks and not get knocked out by them in your quest to find that ultimate happiness. So instead of using equanimity to lower your status for happiness, use it as part of the program to raise your status for happiness. You might call this the equanimity of a winner rather than the equanimity of a loser. The four Sajans made this distinction in different ways. The John Fuang, my own teacher, would talk about small hearted equanimity versus big hearted equanimity. Small hearted is when you get depressed and defeatist. Say so there's nothing good in the world, so I just might as well learn how to be equanimous about it all. Don't have any big expectations. That's a recipe for depression. Big hearted equanimity is when you found a true happiness. You look at the rest of the world and you realize that you're not feeding on the rest of the world anymore. And so you can be equanimous about the ups and downs of what's happening around you. And John Cha has a really nice story about equanimity. A storm went through his monastery one time. And the next day, he went through the monastery to check up on the damage. They came to one hut where half the roof had been blown off by the winds of the storm. And he noticed that the monk was sitting inside the hut, hadn't done anything about the roof. And so he asked him, why aren't you fixing the roof? And the monk said, well, I'm practicing equanimity. And John, John Chan said, this is the equanimity of a water buffalo, not the equanimity of a human being. Fix the roof. In other words, don't make equanimity an excuse to be lazy. Then we look at the Buddhist teachings on equanimity, there are, there are two ways of analyzing them. One in terms of the contact of other qualities that are taught along with equanimity. The other is in terms of levels of equanimity. In terms of the context, equanimity is never taught alone because as I said, there are times when it is skillful and when it is not. And usually when it's skillful, it has to be accompanied by other good qualities of mind. The two main contexts in which you find it are in the Brahma Viharas, for the sublime attitudes of goodwill, compassion, empathetic joy, and equanimity. The other main context is in the Bojangas, or the factors for awakening, where you have mindfulness, analysis of qualities, persistence, rapture, calm, concentration, and then equanimity. In each case, it's put at the end of the list, which is sometimes read as meaning that it's higher than the others, so it's found by overcoming the others. But that's not the case. It has to be mixed with the other qualities in the list at the right time and the right place in order to be skillful. We'll notice that when we look at these two different contexts in terms of the factors for awakening, which are basically about the practice of mindfulness and concentration, how right mindfulness leads to a right concentration. We find that equanimity is selective. We apply it to some things at some times. Whereas in the context of the Brahma Viharas, it's more universal. You have to apply it, be able to apply it in all contexts, again, when necessary. In the context of practicing mindfulness and concentration, you find that the unskillful times have to do with when the mind is sluggish. There's a sutta in the Sangha Tendagaya 4653, 
which compares meditation to starting a fire. And there are times it says when the fire is about to go out. And so those are the times when you don't put more ashes or water on the fire that you actually try to put more fuel into the fire. The analogy here being that you try to use the more active factors for awakening, such as analysis of qualities, persistence, rapture, and times like that. You don't try to develop calm con concentration and equanimity. There are other times though when the mind has too much energy and that's when equanimity, calm and concentration are called for. And you don't try to develop the other more active qualities. There's another sutta, Akangrutta 3103, which illustrates this principle with the image of a goldsmith. As I said, the goldsmith has basically three activities that he has to do with gold. One is he puts it in the fire. Two, he takes it out, put blows on it to cool it off. And then three, he looks at it to see what needs to be done further. Putting it in the fire stands for right effort. Taking it out and blowing it, blowing out it stands for concentration. And then simply looking at it stands for equanimity. So he says, if you do just one of these things at a time, for instance, if you do just right effort or just concentration or just equanimity, there are going to be problems. If you do just effort, it develops restlessness in the mind. If you focus simply on concentration, the mind gets lazy. And if you focus on equanimity, nothing happens. Concentration doesn't get developed. So the role of equanimity here is not that you just watch things and accept them. You're looking at things so that you can figure out what to do with them. And this is illustrated in another sutta where the Buddha is talking to his son about meditation. And before he even teaches him the basic meditation techniques, he tells him, you've got to make your mind like earth. Disgusting things are thrown on earth, but the earth doesn't get disgusted by them. Make it like water, wind, fire. Water is used to wash away disgusting things. Wind blows disgusting things around. Fire can burn disgusting things, but they don't get upset by these things. This is a quality of mind that you want to bring to the meditation so that you can observe what's going on in the mind and make a fair judgment of what needs to be done. So the role of equanimity here is not, it's not indifference. It's not a case that you don't care about what's going on or you're not going to try to do anything about what's going on. It's because you do care and you're trying to figure out exactly what would be the best thing to do. So you have to be able to look at things with a fair and just emotionally neutral mode so that you can figure out what needs to be done best. There's another reason why equanimity is selective in the practice of concentration and mindfulness. And that's because, as the Buddha points out, there are two kinds of causes for suffering in the mind. There are the causes that will go away when you simply look at them with equanimity. And there are others, though, that will not go away. In other words, you look at them and they look right back. They don't get this embarrassed by the fact that you're looking at them. In a case like that, you have to use that, as the Buddha says, you have to exert a fabrication which means that you have to work with the way you breathe, work with the way you talk to yourself about what's going on, work with the perceptions you're holding in mind so that you learn how to overcome that particular phenomenon. We might say that equanimity in the practice of concentration and mindfulness is the equanimity of a craftsman or a soldier. In other words, in face of setbacks, you don't let them get you down. You continue to look for ways to come out victorious. The idea of a craftsman being paired with a soldier may sound strange, but if you've ever read Benvenuto Cellini's autobiography, he makes it sound like being a good craftsman is like doing battle. You may know of his statue of Perseus holding the head of Medusa. It was a very difficult statue to cast, and he talks in very dramatic ways about how he defeated the, 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 his helpers who were discouraged by the, the fact that this was not going to be able to be done. Another great incident in, um, in European history is when the story about Talleyrand and Napoleon. Now, Talleyrand was Napoleon's di the main diplomat. And Napoleon used him, but never really trusted him because he felt that Talleyrand was too independent. And there was one time when he was convinced that Talleyrand was actually plotting to do him in. And so he spent one evening yelling at him in front of all the other ministers. And Talleyrand, as he reported it later, said he showed no emotion at all, which got, of course got Napoleon even more frustrated. Here it is, the most powerful man in Europe yelling at you. 
and you're not showing any emotion. But tell him what I was saying. He was trying to figure out, he was convinced he was probably going to go to jail. And if he did have to go to jail, he was trying to figure out what he was going to be able to do to get out. So instead of getting upset about what was happening, he was able to keep the quiet message and figure out some way of getting past it. Well, as it turned out, Napoleon was so unnerved by Charlie Rowan's sang froid, they didn't do anything. That's a case of using equanimity so that you're not bowled over by setbacks. Then you can keep your mind calm and then figure out a way to get around it. So that's an image for equanimity and the practice of mindfulness and concentration. As I said, it's the equanimity of a craftsman or a soldier. In the context of the Brahma Biharas, or the sublime attitudes, this is where your equanimity has to be universal. You have to be able to apply it to anyone at any time, even those that you really like or really hate. It acts as a reality check on the other Brahma Biharas. You may notice goodwill, compassion, empathetic joy are expressed in terms of saying, may this happen, may all beings be happy, may all beings be free from their suffering, may those who are happy not lose their happiness, may, 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 it's a wish. Whereas expression for equanimity is, all beings are the owners of their actions. It's a statement of fact, so it's a reality check. And it says that you don't get waste energy on areas that can't be helped. And so it can be helpful in upsetting situations and fair to others, regardless of your likes or dislikes for those people. You might say that this is the equanimity of a doctor. You don't get upset about the patient's condition, especially when it doesn't respond to treatment. You focus on what can be done. And you also, you treat the patient regardless of whether you like that person or not. You're fair and equanimous as a basis for strengthening your compassion and goodwill for the person. So those are two cases of equanimity in context, in context of the factors for awakening and in the context of the Brahma Viharas. We see that it has to be combined with other skillful qualities in order to be skillful itself. If you just approach and you know, say a doctor were totally equanimous about things, you wouldn't trust that doctor to treat you well. You want the doctor to have some compassion for you as well. If a soldier were totally equanimous about things, we just see the enemy, you know, the enemy come and just be equanimous about the fact that he, this place is being overrun. Again, it would be a soldier you couldn't trust. So in cases like this, you want to develop equanimity in combination with other factors to make sure that it, it balances them out and the other factors and equanimity strengthen one another. Now, in terms of the levels of equanimity, the canon contains three lists. Two of them are here in the Salayatana and the Panda Sutra. The first one is when the distinction about house-based equanimity and renunciation-based equanimity. Now you remember, if you read the passage, house-based equanimity is the one of, what they say, a run of the normal person who is, has not overcome limitations and the results of action and is blind to danger. But what this means, it's hard to tell from the canon. The canon doesn't explain. The commentary to that passage also is not all that helpful. Apparently, what it refers to is this passage in the Anguttu Nilakaya. One of the Buddha talks about meeting your past bad karma with an, a limited or an unlimited mind. If you have a limited mind, then the effects of karma will have a big effect on you. The Buddha's analogy is of a cup of water. If you put a large salt crystal in the cup of water, you can't drink the water because it's too salty. But if you make your mind unlimited, and you can then, then you're not affected by the results of past bad, bad karma. The analogy here is of a large river of clean water. You throw that same salt crystal into the river and you can drink the water because there's so much more, more water than there is salt. In the same way the Buddha said, if you develop the Brahma Viharas, you're making your mind unlimited. If you learn how to develop virtue and discernment, if you train your mind so that it's not overcome by pleasure, not overcome by pain, then whatever past bad karma you have does not place limitations on you. As for being blind to the danger, you would probably be blind to the danger of sensuality. In other words, when the Buddha is talking about house-based equanimity, it's just that there are certain things you're equanimous about, but the equanimity doesn't extend to other things. It's, it's not a across the board kind of attitude. You're equanimous about things you don't care about. The things you care about, you have either a sense of 
pleasure around them or a sense of disappointment, a sense of distress. So the equanimity is limited to the object that is focused on, the object that it's related to. As soon as the object changes, the equanimity is gone. That's house-based equanimity. Now, renunciation-based equanimity is seeing that all sense objects, both now and before, are a constant stressful subject to change. This equanimity the Buddha says goes beyond the object because you see as a general principle that everything is subject to change and you get equanimous about that fact. This is said to be a result of insight practice. The other list that's put in 173, and it's good to notice that there are two separate lists here. The Buddha talks on equanimity based on multiplicity and equanimity based on singleness. So equanimity based on multiplicity is equanimity for your everyday experiences, whether you have insight into them or not. And even the experience of the four jhanas, this too counts as based on multiplicity. Because when you're in the four jhanas, you can still have an experience of the world outside. You're not focusing on it, but there are sounds, there are smells, there are tastes. Your eyes are open, there are things you see. But you're totally equanimous to them. But still, that you're able to experience the senses. You have to be equanimous to them in order to remain focused on your topic. That's equanimity based on multiplicity. Now, equanimity based on singleness has to do with the formless states. The infinitude of space as an object of meditation, the infinitude of consciousness, nothingness, and neither perception or non perception. But the Buddha says that if you're purely in those states, you will not have an experience. You'll, you don't hear sounds, you, you don't sense the body. You're cut off from your sensory experiences at that point. In which case, the mind is totally single, and your equanimity is totally single. But that kind of equanimity is not the goal. It simply is a concentration state. The Buddha says you go up and go beyond that. To what he says, equanimity leads to non fashioning atayama, atayama. Can I say this word probably? Atayama, atayama, Which means that you're not creating a sense of self around those attainments. So that's where you're applying insight to your meditation and attainments, whether they're the jhanas or the, or the formless states. So you're moving beyond equanimity to something that's higher because it's in, being, being in, involved discernment and that discernment is the kind of discernment that can take you to the threshold of awakening. Now there's another analysis which comes in the Sanyutta 36. Right? The number of the circle, Sanyutta 36 something. And it talks about there are three levels of equanimity. Start with everyday equanimity, which is around pleasing objects of the senses, and going all the way up through the first three jhanas. And then there's equanimity, which is said to be that this is called equanimity of the flesh. Then there's equanimity not of the flesh, which is the equanimity of the fourth jhana. And the mind is settled in and totally equanimous about <clears throat> its object. There's a sense of sort of neutrality in the body. But it's a pleasant neutrality. You get to, and it gets everything gets so refined in the body that even the breath in and out breathing stops. You still have a sense of the breath energy in the body, but the in and out breathing is gone. And then there's what the, the Buddha calls equanimity, which is more non, not of the flesh than not of the flesh. And that's the equanimity that comes after awakening, after your mind has been totally freed from passion, aversion, and delusion. Then when you reflect on it, you could either feel feelings of rapture, feelings of pleasure, or feelings of equanimity. This is a side effect of, of, of awakening. So that's another way of analyzing levels of equanimity. So you've got three in all, the two, the two analyses of levels of equanimity that we have in module 137, and the one that comes in the singular to 36. Now there's some practical issues that are raised based on these lists. One is the equanimity of meditation. Mindful equanimity is the lowest of the three. You know, sometimes you hear about mindfulness practice being getting you to a state of equanimity, which is what it's all about, but it's not what it's all about. It's the lowest level of equanimity you can have. Even some of the early levels of jhana count as just everyday equanimity. So 
And so the lesson here is that you don't try to clone the equanimity of awakening. We all hear that a person who's awakening can be equanimous about things. And so we just say, well, I'll just make myself equanimous. But that's just, you know, how space equanimity, like equanimity based on multiplicity and equanimity of the flesh. You have gotta go beyond that. The second point is that you have to use ordinary equanimity in order to reach the first levels of John, even to get up to the floor before you get, before equanimity gets established. This relates to that image of making the mind like earth, water, wind, and fire. And you have to train the mind so that it speak, can be non-reactive enough so that you can get the mind to can settle down. As for equanimity in daily life, this is basically an application of the sublime attitudes. Its purpose is to let go of what cannot be changed or whose change cannot be stopped. So you can focus energy on what can be changed or the change can be stopped. In other words, the question of your priorities is where you want to focus your energy. You accept the duties that get in the way of which you want. In other words, as you practice as a lay person, you have to realize that there are certain duties you've got that are going to get in the way of your practice. You have to be equanimous about those. You have to learn how to talk to yourself in ways that don't get you upset. One of the issues that Thai, the Thai force of John's account that constantly meeting up with is people say, well, I don't have time to meditate. And they say, well, do you have time to breathe? And they're like, yes. Okay, then you have time to sort of be with your breath as much as you can. So it may not be all the time, but you learn to look for the opportunities that you have and learn how not to get upset by the time is when you find it impossible or difficult to focus on the breath. Just say, okay, I'm, I'm learning how to develop other qualities in my meditation, other perfections, and to learn how to have a, a balanced attitude toward your practice in daily life. And that way you will progress a lot more easily. As some people say, if, if, you are, if you're going to be totally non-attached, how can you live in this world? But we're not saying to be totally non-attached. It's more of an issue of learning how not to feed, even when there is emotional attachment and affection. I mean, even the monks are expected to have affection for one another. The, the senior monks are supposed to treat the junior monks as their children. And have the same attitude towards them that the father would have to a son. So the Buddha doesn't say that you shouldn't have affection for one another. It's basically saying using your discernment and seeing how to have affection for someone, but may not make your happiness dependent on that particular relationship. It's difficult, but that's a skill that needs to be developed as part of the practice. And in general, using equanimity in daily life involves discernment. You have to see which issues are worth focusing on, and which issues are not worth focusing on. It's a matter of priorities. You might think of it, the analogy of a chess game. You have to be willing to lose some of your pieces if you want to come out winning. Now, in both cases, both in meditation and in daily life, we're talking about the equanimity of a winner, as I said, not the equanimity of a loser. Someone who knows how to develop equanimity in order to get to the goal. As for the goal itself, equanimity, as I said, is needed to get there, but it's not the same thing. And this is another point of confusion. Sometimes you hear it said that the purpose of the practice is to be equanimous in all situations. That's not the purpose, it's, it's part of the path. Majjhima 106 explains why equanimity is not the goal. And there can still be a sense of attachment clinging to the equanimity, even on very subtle levels of concentration. And so you need to, in order to develop discernment, in order to get rid of that last vestige of clinging and feeding, sort of emotional feeding on it. And the equanimity. As for the equanimity that's associated with the attainment itself, remember that nirvana is the foremost happiness. It's the place where the Buddha says it's the foremost equanimity. When that is secure, you can look back on the mind with equanimity, noting that there's no more that needs to be done. And as you look at everything else, you realize that you no longer have to feed on these things. So no matter what, how they change, it's not going to affect you. It's like looking at reports of the weather, weather on Mars. It's not gonna affect you. So you, you, if there's a horrible sandstorm or whatever, okay, you just watch it, you know about it. But it doesn't affect you because it's not something that you're feeding on anymore. Because you found something better. 
something where you don't need to feed, but it's a happiness that's there. It's a constant. So those are some of the issues around equanimity, understanding how it fits in with the practice of mindfulness and concentration in the context of the practice of awakening. How it fits in together with the practice of developing goodwill, compassion, and athletic joy in the sublime attitudes. And the different levels that we have. Um, focusing on the fact that it is possible to develop everyday equanimity, and it is part of the path in order to get the mind to settle down. You really have to learn how to develop this kind of equanimity. But then it will develop to higher and higher levels that are more and more solid, which will be more and more conducive to getting to the, getting to the goal. So those are some thoughts about equanimity. I was wondering if you had any questions about that topic or anything else related to the sutta. Okay, well, thank you for your attention. Thank you so much for your visit. We really appreciate it very much and we'll be discussing and questioning what we learned. And when we have more questions, we're gonna throw them out to you. Okay, fine. Be great, thank you. Okay. Be well. Be well. Okay. Good night. Good night. Thank you, Arjun. You're welcome.